I'm not going to repeat this. I'm still fighting uh, in a number of uh, lawsuits uh, after this one, I can tell you. People were very, very, very uh, embarrassed afterwards, including me. Mm. All right, this, no, this one will be easier. I cannot top that, even, even I cannot top that presentation. So we'll have a boring one tonight, no, today, I mean. All right, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, um, my name is Jurgen Apollo. I, I, I am here because I wrote this blog, noab.nl. Uh, I'm still doing that. I started it in 2008, and the reason I started that blog is because I wanted to write a book. But I failed a couple of times before. I tried in 2002 and 2008, uh, wrote about 40, 50 pages, and then did not know how to proceed. Uh, then I thought, hmm, maybe I should start as a blog, deliver my text in small increments and get some feedback going. Oh, what a novel idea, isn't that? Huh. So, and that worked, that worked. That ultimately led to this book, Manager 3.0. Thank you, Jose, for uh, telling everyone to buy it. Uh, I wrote this little one, How to Change the World, uh, this year. It sort of emerged spontaneously without even me realizing it. And, uh, and now I do courses all over the world based on the book, uh, uh, from Russia to Australia, from Germany to South America. And, uh, and they're doing, uh, doing fine. And, uh, and things are working well now, <coughs> for me at least. You see, this is a list that was published just a couple of months ago. In April, it says these are the most influential people, in quotes, in quotes, in, the, in Agile in the world. Mike Cohn is number one, Ken Schwaber number two, Bob Martin, we know them all. And look at that. Wow, Woo, that's so nice. I was so happy when I saw this. <laughs> so, but to be honest, I have it in quotes because you should not take it too serious. Really, you should not take it too serious. I know how these statistics were, were, were used. Paul Darrell uh, is, is a person I know. I know how he did it. And uh, there are actually only 10 people in the world who take this list serious, right? They're all listed here. <laughs> I have to, because I'm on the list, so that's why I have to show you. All right. Good. So, this is Melly. This is Melly. Suppose, uh, imagine that Melly is your colleague. Melly is, is smiling over her shoulder, uh, looking at you friendly, and when you pass by, you think, hmm. Melly's doing a good job. Uh, Melly seems to be enjoying her work. She's always smiling when I pass by. Well, actually, Melly Sham hates her job. Ooh, that's a terrible thing. Melly Sham hates her job. That's, that's, that's not so nice. And in fact, there's research out there, it, uh, uh, quoted in Fast Company, today over half of American workers effectively hate their jobs. That's so sad. And I read a book by, uh, by Gary Hamill, his latest book, What Matters Now, and he has global figures, global numbers. They are basically the same. <clears throat> More than half of the people in the world hate America. They hate, sorry, hate their jobs. <laughs> so, I'm so sorry. <laughs> sorry, Lisa. God. <sighs> again and again, same mistake every time. More than half of the people in the world <clears throat> hate their jobs. That's, uh, that's not so good. Actually, I think we've been hating our jobs for 100,000 years or more. There's this very interesting model called spiral dynamics. You may have heard of it. Uh, it looks a bit like a tornado that went to Rio de Janeiro. And uh, it consists of a number of, of levels and, and colors. And it starts with a beige color. That was, uh, that was uh, the way of organizing things were basically run away from lions and chase after mammoths. If you did both, if you did both then you were a geographically very confused person, I think. But anyways, that was the basic idea. And we don't do that anymore, do we? We do not run away from problems, right? We do not chase after the latest fads and fashions, right? We are long, long past that level, I would say. The purple level is the second one. Your job was to do what the tribe demanded from you, because tribes were being formed. And uh, this was basically, uh, well, this was organization. Tribes were being formed, you had to do what the tribe said. We don't do that, right? We don't do nonsensical rituals that are just demanded of us because we belong to a tribe. That's long, long, long past us, I would say. And then 
The red level, that is, uh, the tribes went to war with each other and, and they, they stole things from the other tribes. That was also not a lot of fun. They were competing uh, uh, with, uh, with each other. And then the, the next level, the blue level, is uh, when, when formal governments were being, were being uh, installed. And basically your job was to bow to central authority. And there was slavery uh, even in, uh, uh, in, those, in those times. Terrible, terrible, not a lot of fun. Nobody was really enjoying the jobs, I think. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm certain nobody feels like a slave anymore these days, do we? Right? Nobody feels like a slave of the product owner. No, no, no. So, <clears throat> my question is, um, are, you, are you suffering from central authority too? Imagine this is you. Imagine this is you. This is actually my cousin Eric. He has a funny face. And I have his permission to use his photo. If he did not say yes, then I would have asked Lasse Koskela. <laughs> and um, so it's, it's, imagine this is you, and you wonder, is, am I suffering from central, from central authority? And you tell Melly, Melly, we cannot go on like this. We cannot go on like this, hating our jobs. We have to do something. Maybe, maybe if we just perform better. Maybe if we perform better, if we achieve better results, then everyone will be happier because we will enjoy the results of, this, of, us, of our work. Well, some people say we can help with that. This is Eddie. He is an organizational theorist, and he has some good ideas about organization. We can help with that, he says. I see the organization as a machine. A, sh a machine that we can improve. And this is the basic philosophy behind scientific management, some flavors of project management, structured programming, which I have uh, been taught in the 80s of last century. It was all construction, a lot of construction going on. And uh, the idea was you play a part in the whole construction. You have your job, you have your job. And uh, you have been assigned goals and you should not be disturbing the others. Do not disturb the others. Like for example, Janet, your job is to paint sticky notes. There's a huge demand of sticky notes out there. You have to paint them yellow and blue and green and orange. There's a, there's a large demand for yellow, by the way. So it pays special attention to that. I don't know why, but a lot of yellow, right? So, uh, and uh, Mitch, you put the glue on. You put the glue on the sticky notes. A very important job, because the whole point of a sticky note is that they stick, right? So you put the blue, uh, glue on. And then who we have here, Jose, you run up and down. You run up and down between Janet and Mitch, right? You make sure that they each can work. This is very important. You are the key here between those two, between those two roles. Well, this is, this is the orange level, the orange level spiral dynamics. You all have your own jobs. And Janet, don't worry about Mitch. It's not your job. I am the manager here, right? So if you have an issue, come to me, and I will talk to Mitch, and then say, well, Janet has a problem. You should go faster, right? This is what we do. We have a performance appraisal at the end of the year, uh, Jose and I will get some 360 input on, on, on your behavior by the others. Right? So that is the orange level. It doesn't work. It does not work. There's a lot of uh, uh, reports, there are a lot of reports out there, like this one in Fortune magazine, 70% of all strategies and projects fail. They are managed in this way. Uh, same with the Standish group. You all have heard of the chaos report, probably no speaker can do a keynote without referring to the Standish report. Uh, so, same, same figures, a lot of failure out there. And this is, this is my representation of the, of the system, the employees in it, the, the workers, they're not happy, the, the stakeholders, shareholders, uh, customers, communities, suppliers, I would say most of them are not very satisfied about the way we do things uh, uh, in, in that, with that philosophy. So you say, we're still not happy, maybe we should work toward a greater purpose. Maybe let's realize that we're in it together somehow. Uh, and Eddie says, I have some new ideas. I can help with that. I now see the organization as a team sport. We work together against the others. Right? We have to win. Beat the competition. Janet, we're going to kick their ass. Right? That is what we're going to do together as a team. And that is the idea behind Six Sigma and total quality management, the theory of constraints and business process re-engineering. Like, <clears throat> for example, Jose, you are the problem here. We've seen. Sorry, you're not running fast enough. You are the constraints, says the theory of constraints. Right? So, 
Yeah, sure. I understand. I understand. So I'm going to give you Mini Jose. You will get Mini Jose. Now you're a manager. Ooh, that's cool. So now you can manage Mini Jose, and together you walk up and down between Mitch and between, uh, and between Janet, running up and down, delivering the sticky notes. But that still doesn't work. Then business process reengineering says, no, you should reinvent your process. So somebody comes here and says, I have a great idea. Well, let's just stand together as a team. And Jose, you hold up the sticky note while Janet paints it from one side and Mitch puts the glue on on the other side. That's re reinventing the process, right? And at the right moment, you switch the sticky note and then do this as fast as possible. Wow, you've reinvented your process. Everyone happier now, right? We're all enjoying our jobs, hopefully. Well, I don't think so. That's the idea. We all have to change for the greater, greater good. And that's the green level. Sacrifice yourself in order to achieve group harmony. It doesn't work that well. It doesn't work that well. All these fads and fashions fail to deliver on their promises, said Harvard Business uh, Review. And uh, they have a short, uh, short life cycle. So I would say a lot of stakeholders are still not very happy. Maybe some, some, some uh, business owners have profited handsomely from... Uh, uh, from this approach, but the majority, hmm, not so much. And at the same time, the world is getting more complex. Things are happening in the world outside. Like, for example, globalization goes up, innovation goes up, democratization goes up, diversification goes up, all kinds of Asians are going up in the world. It's amazing. Look at any scrum team. You see, you see certification, gamification, fornication is all going up. So, this is a problem. Things, things become a bit unpredictable. Uncertainty goes up. Every day we know less and less about what is going to happen with, with the world outside. And, and all these value exchanges with the, with the world, they, they change from day to day until the system fails. I worked for a whole night on this animation. I hope, <laughs> I hope you liked it. Right? Thank you. Just saying, just saying. So. I, ha I think we can do better if we understand that the organization is a complex system, that it is alive. It should be, it should be managed that way. So uh, you say, well, that's very interesting, Jorgen, but how can we increase our health and become happier as a, as a living complex, uh, complex system? Well, <clears throat> Eddie is a bit older now. He has gray hairs, you see, that's for wisdom. And he says, I have some new ideas. I now see the organization as a community. The team is a community, the business is a community, the industry is a community. They're all communities at all levels. And this is, I think, the, the idea behind Agile and beyond Lean and Scrum, Kanban, all those, all those great, uh, uh, great ideas that we had over the last uh, decade or so. And the idea is do whatever you want, but the community should benefit from your contributions and at the same time the community should, should honor you and respect you at the same time. Right? It goes both ways. And this is the idea of the yellow level. Your job is to express yourself, but avoid harm and help others. So the customer is demanding more sticky notes and more sticky notes. And, 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 and then Janet wonders, why do, you, why do you want so many sticky notes? You start asking the customer. And ask, but the customer says, they keep falling down. We have them on the windows, but they keep falling down. And the, the hallways look like autumn. Sticky notes everywhere. They, they, it's, it's, it's not working. So Mitch says, let's, let's go and see. Let's go and see for ourselves what they're struggling with. So you see all these sticky notes, and they're trying to put them on the windows and don't stick. And then, then Jose has a marvelous idea. He says, let's not create sticky notes. Let's do something else. Let's make tiny whiteboards, tiny whiteboards that people can write on. And then Mitch says, yeah, I know somebody so, who, somebody who can produce suction cups. So we can... So we can put them on the window, right? And then we have something like this, a task board that really sucks. <laughs> it's amazing. I was in Rotterdam in a company and the teams themselves came up with, an, with something like this. This is innovation. This is an agile team creating real solutions instead of optimizing the process. Right? Re-engineering the process. Who cares what the process is? This is fun. These are happy people. 
So this is working. And these are the benefits obtained from Agile, I would, uh, I would say. This is confirmed in, in, in the Agile survey by version one. Managing changing priorities, dealing with that changing environment is number one. And number four, here you see improved team morale. Ta-da! Happier people. That's important. Happy people. So employees are happier. Customers are happy. Ooh, wow, they have an amazing task board. There are, even, there are uh, companies, other companies, traveling to that company in Rotterdam just to see how they created their task boards. It's amazing. It's fun. And uh, uh, at the same time, shareholders, business owners are uh, indirectly happier. What we have not addressed yet is, lo is the local community or society as a whole. Or business partners and suppliers. They are somehow out of the equation still. But we're making progress, I would say. Interestingly enough, <clears throat> different community leaders suggest fixing things in different ways. Like, for example, Scrum. We all know Scrum, right? We all know that... Uh... <laughs> what? <laughs> You're pulling my leg here. Oh, okay. So, you all know Scrum. This is, Scrum is the implementation, I would say, of, 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 of that iterative cycle that I also had with my book. Right? I, I realized I have to deliver in shorter increments. Well, Scrum is exactly the same thing. Deliver in short increments and get feedback from, uh, from the market. That's, that's working. How many of you are f familiar with or experienced with Scrum? Let's see the hands. Woohoo! That's great. All right. Awesome. So, let's see the next one. Kanban. How many of you are familiar with or experienced with Kanban? Just as many hands. Wow, this is amazing. For me, it's almost the same thing. For, I look at it at the meta level. This is the same philosophy. The details are, of course, different. You, you limit your working progress in the, in the vertical sense instead of the horizontal sense. So, uh, whip limits instead of time boxes. But those are the details. Experiment with those. That's, that's great. But how many of you are familiar with or applying beyond budgeting? Ah, you see. One hand, two... Uh, <laughs> all right, this is a great idea. This is from Scandinavia, where they also gave us ABBA and Volvo and Rednecks. Ooh. And um, the, uh, the idea is that, that annual budgets make no sense. They make no sense anymore. It made sense 100 years ago to create a budget for the next year, but nowadays things change too fast. Before the ink of the budgets has dried, the environment has changed already. So just let's stop doing it. Let's just stop fooling ourselves with budgets, they say. But then people ask, of course, how do you prevent people from spending too much money? Well, they say, come up with something else, like full transparency. Make sure that everyone knows how much is being spent by everyone in the organization. It's the shared money part, so everyone has the right to know who took something out. Like if you want to go to a conference in, in Potsdam and you want to fly business class or whatever, go ahead. But everyone will see what the price of the ticket was and what the, the admission fee was. You'll just have to be able to explain it, to defend it. And it turns out in the companies where they implemented this, like Statoil and a number of other companies, expenses actually go down. This peer pressure makes sure that nobody wants to be the one who spends the most money. I understand it's a cultural thing in, 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 in the Spain, probably the, the expenses go up because everyone wants to spend the most. <laughs> well, in, in many European countries, uh, the expenses would actually go, uh, go down. Now, Lean Startup is, uh, is another interesting uh, uh, movement. How many of you are familiar with or experienced with Lean Startup? Oh, that's great. That's great. A number of hands go up. That's more than beyond budgeting. Good. I think this is another feedback cycle that was added onto Agile. Like, we all know that Agile says uh, working software over processes and tools, right? Working software. Uh, well, I created working software once. I created a bookkeeping program 20 years ago, and it was fantastic. I'm still using it, and after 20 years, I only found three bugs. Three bugs. I'm very proud of that. High quality software. There's only one very small problem. Nobody else in the world is using my program. I'm the only one. How sad. So, in lean startup terms, I failed. I created something that the market didn't want. I was unable to sell it. The market didn't care. So, I spent two fucking years creating that, 
creating that bookkeeping program that nobody wanted. That's waste, they said. It was working software, it was working amazingly well. But who cares if the working software is working if nobody wants to pay for it? So that is an another feedback cycle. I think they did that well. And then this one, design thinking. Ooh, that's an interesting one. This, <laughs> what? Whatever, okay. Design thinking. Design thinking is, uh, is an idea from the 80s of last, uh, last century. And uh, they came up with, with some prescriptions for creating the best possible designs for products. And the three, three of the principles are, uh, one, intensive custom collaboration, like actually go to the workplace where customers want to use your products and pretend to be the customer and try it. And then second, iterate the hell out of it, create a lot of do a lot of iterations, and third, work with cross-functional teams. What an amazing idea. <laughs> Interesting. Ten years before we started to call this stuff agile, they already called it design thinking. So you probably understand now that I don't care that much about the individual brands. Agile, lean, beyond budgeting, lean startup, design thinking, and there are plenty more. We all have the same conclusions over the last few decades. Things are not working, and now we know why things are working, and we do it in a different way, uh, recognizing that people are communities. All right, so this is you, remember? And uh, you say, okay, we're making progress, but we still have problems to solve. These are the main barriers to agile adoption, according to the version, uh, version one survey. The ability to change the organization's culture. That is a big, dip, uh, big problem. Many people complain about uh, bureaucracy, command and control hierarchies, and stuff like that. And a general resistance to change is number three. Also a big problem. People don't want to be changed by others. People have no problem changing, but they don't want to be changed by other people. So that is, uh, that is why many talks, many sessions at Agile conferences nowadays are about organizational transformation, change management, how to change the world, all that, all that kind of stuff. Right? So <clears throat> that is, uh, that is the, one of the main topics these days. Maybe we can do better if we really understand complexity thinking. That is at least my opinion. So let's, uh, let's see what, uh, why Agile works uh, by looking at complexity science and systems thinking. I have plenty of suggestions there, but four that I think are, are, are crucial that I want to uh, point out here. First of all, um, evolutionary systems by their nature involve experimentation, running experiments. There are three ways for systems to survive, including organizations, teams, etc. Anticipate, adapt, and explore. Anticipating means predicting things, and we are quite good at that as human beings. Daniel Dennett, a philosopher, said the human brain is an anticipation device. We are actually able to forecast things, like we know where earthquakes will likely happen in the world. That is anticipation. We can, we can plan for that. The problem is we got addicted to it. We, we, we try to anticipate everything. It's like alcohol. We should cut down on the anticipation a little bit. It is healthy only in small doses, right? So uh, Agile has turned, uh, taught us to do some more adaptation, like the rest of the natural world. Adapt. Be prepared for what, what happens, what could happen out there. Um, and exploration is the third one that sometimes seems to be missing. That is, trying things out for the sake of trying. It's not anticipating because you don't know if it's going to work. It's an experiment. Uh, it's not adapting, because nobody says that you should do something different. No, you just run an experiment. Like I ordered a chai tea latte at Starbucks a couple of weeks ago. I hated it. I threw it away. Why do they sell these things? I don't know. So I threw it away. But it was an experiment. It was a safe-to-fail experiment. I, I uh, suspected that I would survive that experiment. So safe-to-fail is important. And it's like sending an, a scout in unknown terrain. right? Hopefully, the scout comes back. If not, everyone else goes that way. Right? That is experimentation. We do that in the agile world sometimes in, in extreme programming. They call it spikes, for example. Architectural experimentation. Let's see if we can get wire these things together. Let's explore the architecture and technologies that we're working with. Another thing that we're doing well is stealing and tweaking. 
We usually think of innovation as inventing new things, but that's a bit silly, actually. It's smarter to think of, think of it as recombining old ones. Uh, the complexity researcher ha researchers had virtual systems compete with each other in, 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 on computers and measured how, how, much they, how much time they spent uh, innovating. And it turns out that they spent 95% stealing each other's practices. And only 5% of the time was spent coming up with really inspirational new ideas. So most of the time spent stealing stuff from others. Things that already work for others, they are likely to work for you as well. That is simply a good return on investment. Low investment, high return. So steal ideas from others and tweak them to your context. I sometimes call it the Samsung method. It works amazingly well. It works very well. I'm a Samsung fan, mind you. Right. So they do exactly what the science says you should be doing. Steal and tweak. <clears throat> like I came up with, with a very simple idea, happiness door. Two ideas already existed. The feedback walls were already used by, hap by, by, by agile coaches. Sticky notes on walls. The happiness index also existed before. A scale of one to five. I thought, hmm, maybe we can combine the two. Have a door near the exit where people leave for lunch or something. And then happiness index there, and then they could put the feedback there. And also indicate how happy they are. Simple. But now they, happiness doors are used all over Europe at conferences and even at some schools. It's a very simple practice. But this is innovation too. Wiring together uh, different ideas that already existed. Develop models in collaboration. <coughs> that, is, uh, that is the next one I want to point out. Uh, we have some experience with people creating big processes. Uh, like uh, the, the, the big documents full of models and diagrams and prescriptions of what you should be doing or what you could be doing in your project. Sometimes we call it the Rational Unified Process, sometimes CMMI, sometimes uh, PRINCE2. There's always some kind of body creating a kind of document for people. Well, that is all nice, but Ralph Stacey, complexity researcher, said uh, those who formulate the abstractions those ivory tower people, they make a gesture, a suggestion, whose meaning can only emerge in many local interactions. That is what he calls self-organization. So Ralph Stacey says, only the self-organizing system can determine what makes sense to them. This is science that I'm talking about here, right? So only a self-organized system can make sense of the world in which it lives, that is, the team. So the team has to create the process. I think a perfect example is the Kanban board, or for some, the Scrum board. This is the process. The columns that we have here, swim lanes, if you have any different colors of sticky notes, whatever, that is the process. The process is what we see. The process is not in some kind of binder that is collecting dust in a closet. That can never be a process. Those are suggestions. Treat them as, as suggestions. And then shorten the feedback cycle. Learn faster. The only way to win is learn faster than anyone else, said Eric Ries. That is, I like that. There's a famous, famous joke that says, how do, you, how do you survive the attack of a bear? Run faster than the other guy. That is how you survive. Very simple. Just run faster. You don't have to be a marathon runner. Just run faster than the others that you're, that you're competing with. So um, we've discovered that feedback cycles have to go faster and faster, even, even within, the, uh, within the agile world, I would say. For example, in, in Scrum, just uh, for uh, uh, just uh, uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, what are you laughing at? Jesus Christ, you're a very disturbing audience here. So just 10, 15 years ago, uh, Scrum was defined as four-week sprints. Four-week sprints. That was revolutionary back then. Right? Nowadays we say, you do four-week sprints, that's vintage Scrum. Right? We do one-week sprints nowadays. Or some people do continuous deployment. They, 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 they deliver every day. So it goes faster and faster, even in, in the agile world. These are fundamental insights from science about complex systems surviving and the same things we apply in, in the real world or the unicorn, unicorn world, as some people prefer to say. All right. How can we solve the remaining problems? Because we still have some problems to solve. Well, Eddie says, screw you. You're on your own now. I have no ideas anymore. Sorry, I ran out. <laughs> Some people see the organization as a brain, as something that is amorphous, uh, hard to define, perhaps. 
And I think uh, there are a lot of, lot, of, uh, lot of systems thinkers and complexity thinkers perhaps trying to conceive what that last level means. There's a lot of thinking going on, actually. Like a, a very interesting question, what exactly is the organization? This is very hard to define every, uh, sometimes, because legal entities do not often represent uh, the, the organizations as we perceive them. Like I know, for example, Lufthansa actually consists of many small companies. Same with lots of other businesses out there. So uh, this is the turquoise level of, 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 uh, of spiral dynamics, where we have lots of difficult questions, lots of interesting uh, questions to solve. Um, one friend of mine, uh, Vashka Duarte, some of you uh, know him probably, uh, he said, uh, for example, I want to help organizations die faster. That's interesting. Because <laughs> his philosophy is that uh, over the years, the lifespan of organizations has decreased. They live for shorter and shorter uh, periods of time. And he says, that's good. It means as an economy, as people, we, we are learning faster now how to create good businesses. I thought, well, he has a point there, actually. That's interesting. Maybe the CEOs of those organizations would not agree, but I don't care. <laughs> it's, an, it's a good question to ask. So one of the remaining questions is this one. Can we, can we do this? Can we make everyone happy? I'm an optimist. I think we can. At least I have fun trying, so that's good, I suppose. And now I call that management workout. Management workout. That is um, uh, making sure that the organization is healthy, that it is able to deal with a changing environment, that, that, that anything that happens, the organizational body is prepared to deal with it. But you'll have to be healthy in order to, in order to say that. So management workout. And I think the... the uh, I noticed that the English word... <laughs> Lisa, you're very, very... You're, you're really annoying me. <laughs> My God. Could you... I don't, know, I don't know what you see here, but this is just... I don't know, whatever. We'll talk about that later. The English firm... <laughs> the English firm to manage is, is actually from the Italian word manageare, which means taking care of horses. <laughs> what? <laughs> What? <laughs> Taking care of horses, meaning to handle and train horses. That is awesome. Horses are living systems. It doesn't mean managing a car. It means taking care of something that is alive. And, and yes, some, some businesses are like race horses. Some organizations are like, like uh, sturdy horses that pull wagons and carts full of tourists. Some organizations are like My Little Pony, perhaps. But they're all horses, metaphorically speaking. They, we, have to, we have to take care of them. And uh, the word manage, actually, manage in my, in my language, Dutch, it means a place where we keep horses. Same in German and, and Swedish, very similar words. So uh, it's, that's, a nice, that's a nice metaphor. And uh, who, is, uh, <coughs> who is taking care? Well, uh, management is, uh, is taking care of, uh, of horses. Management is taking care of organizations. And it's all about human beings, said Peter Drucker. Uh, uh, people are responsible, or management is responsible for, for, uh, for uh, um, making people capable of joint performance. And this is the reason that management is the critical determining factor. Management is the critical determining factor. Otherwise, if you don't do it well, you get all these problems of organizational culture, the resistance to change, etc. But notice, Drucker said management. He did not say managers. Subtle difference, right? So, here's a question for you. Do all organizations need testing? Yes, of course, they need testing. Do all organizations need testers? Well, that depends. That depends, right? It depends on how big the organization is, if people want to specialize and stuff, and oh, that's okay. You figure that out on your own. But you will need testing. Everyone is involved in testing, not just the testers, if you have any. It's everyone's responsibility. So. I also say now, management is too important to be left to the managers. We are all involved. Everyone is involved in management of that system. And yes, if you have managers, they are specialists. They should do more of it than the rest. But the others cannot say, oh, no, that's your problem. No, we're, we're involved together. We all participate in that workout, making the organization happier. So I call it Management 3.0. This is Marty, the wacky management model again. 
People like it. They can remember it. They cannot remember all the silly models that Gary Hamill and Henry Minsberg and all the others can come up with, all the stupid squares and rectangles and circles. This is Marty. Marty is cool. Marty is a monster. And Marty has six eyes on the organization. I will give you some examples of what it means to become a healthier organization. Healthy workout practices that everyone here can introduce. Not just managers, everyone. Energize people. People are the most important parts of the organization, and, and we have to take care that, that, they are, that they are creative and motivated and energetic. Here's a nice example. It was given to me by, uh, by Paul Klipp in Poland. A uh, small company, small software company, and they have what he calls a kudo box. And other organizations have similar, similar practices. It's a kudo box. Uh, it's a virtual box in their case. It's an email box where people can drop compliments. Drop compliments about others. Like, for example, Mitch did a fantastic job yesterday helping me out with a project. Otherwise, we would not have made the deadline. I give him a compliment, whatever. Congratulations, Mitch, by the way. Yeah. So, uh, Paul says, anyone who receives a compliment gets a little present. Gets a little present. A bunch of flowers, chocolates, uh, some movie tickets, dinner for two, whatever. And the CEO himself comes with a tray of the presents and that person can pick one. And everyone celebrates, yay, that person got a present. It's just a small token of appreciation. And he said, people love giving each other presents. They give even presents to each other's parents when they baked cookies or whatever. And he said, on the corporate budget, it means nothing. All those little presents, who cares? It's a couple of hundred uh, euros or, 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 or something. But the change, the transformation it has uh, enabled them was, 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 was great, was magnificent. People were now focusing on the positive things that they were doing instead of the negative things. Because organizations always focus on the bad stuff, right? Things that went wrong. Well, system science says you get more of what you focus on. You get more of what you focus on. So you should focus on the positive things that we're doing, not the bad things that we're doing. Then you get more of that. So the kudo box, that's a great, great practice. And everyone can start to start doing this. Whether or not you give those people a present, you can, everyone can start installing a kudo box and giving each other compliments and celebrate those compliments. Next part of the model, <clears throat> empower teams. Uh, teams have to self-organize and, and need, need to feel empowered to make their own decisions. Ooh, this is scary for some managers. People are going to make their own decisions, then I'm not needed anymore. Well, not really. Management is still necessary. You just have to do it in a different way. Like if we see the organization as a horse, as a self-organizing system, that would be a wild horse, you would, would be an idiot to go sit on that wild horse and hit it and say, yeehaw! And then hope, pray, that it goes in the direction where you want. I don't think that will work. Right? So you need a bit more. You need the reins and the spurs and stuff like that. So, well, these are the reins and the spurs for, self, for a self-organizing team. An authority board or a delegation board. It, does, it says in which areas, in which key decision areas, can people make their own decision? And what is, what is the delegation level? Some organizations or some managers benefit from this. Make it more clear, radiate it, radiate the information to the people. So everyone knows, all right, team membership, for example, suppose this says team, uh, team membership, we can decide for ourselves as teams, that would be level five, with input from management. So they give us suggestions, but we decide as team members. Well, that would be level five in that case. This is how you can manage the system, and that gives managers a, more, a, more, a feeling of control, a, a safe to fail. Ah, they still have something to manage, but they manage the board. They don't manage the people, they manage the board. Makes it much easier. And then you can get them along. Again, everyone can introduce this. Even a team can put up a delegation board and communicate to management, like, this is how we perceive that things are delegated to us. Here we can make our own decisions. Could you check, please? Let's go through this for five minutes. Easy, anyone can do that. Align constraints. This is about goal setting. Once you have constrained the self-organized system, you want it to go in a certain direction. Give it a goal, give it an, uh, their, its, its own identity. I was at a company yesterday night, this is a very fresh uh, photograph of, um, of ResearchGate, a company of about 40 people here in, here in Berlin. And I've always been saying, I've always been telling people that they should stimulate teams to come up with their own names, to come up with their own identities. Well, they do it at ResearchGate. They have, uh, all the teams have their own names that they came up with themselves. Except for this one, they were still uh, trying to come up with, uh, with a name. But the others all have names. 
and uh, the constraint of management is all names should have an R and a G because they're called research gates, the companies. So all team names must have an R and a G. So gummy bears, synergy, uh, Vorsprung, etc., etc. Uh, I heard there's one, there's one team missing here, the obvious one, the system administrators are called the Borg. Obvious, yeah. So um, I love that. I love that. Teams create their own names. They create their own identity, their own purpose. It's, it's wonderful. Next one, develop competence. We have to make sure that people are able to move in the right, uh, in the right direction, that they actually, actually make progress, um, progress, that this requires development of, of competences. Well, we can do something there. Uh, uh, this is a picture that I took in, uh, in Norway of a company in Oslo. Uh, Tanberg, they were called, and now they're called Cisco Systems. Cisco Systems Norway. And uh, uh, Tanberg uh, creates these, these high quality um, uh, conferencing equipment, uh, screens and, and cameras and microphones that the boardrooms of the biggest companies in the world use to communicate with each other across the world. High level equipment. And uh, Olva is a guy who showed me around and he showed me this football table. It's an amazing football table. It is in their canteen. And they, play, and they not only play football here, but they also tweak the table. For example, uh, there's a laser beam here. I will show the laser beam with my laser beam. There's a laser beam here <coughs> that they installed in the goal that detects whether goals are being scored. And they also have a security card swiper that is here. You can barely see it. A security card swiper. Everyone walks with these security cards, and they can swipe that, that uh, swiper. That's what you do with swipers. You swipe it. And the table then knows who is playing. So the table itself keeps the score. It's awesome. And they said, well, the next thing that we're going to do, we're thinking of installing a little camera here. So we can replay the best goals in slow motion. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. So the message that Olva had here was, some organizations create these innovation corners with a lot of colorful cushions and flowery wallpaper and stuff like that. And they tell people, go be innovative and creative there. <laughs> it's not working. He said, we want to be creative here <laughs> while we're playing. Because this is how we learn. And their goal is to be creative and in, in technologies and wire hardware together and see if they can get things to work. Fantastic. And management allows them all the time they want. Even if they want to play for an entire week, tweaking their table, they allow them. Because this is how they get the best technicians in, 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 in Norway. Tweaking football tables, so later they can use that knowledge in the, in the product. All right, nearly there. Growth structure, that is the fifth one. We have to make sure that, 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 that we think about the organizational structure. If you have multiple teams and multiple units and, and stuff. And uh, one example I have, uh, it was just released uh, last week, a document about the organizational structure at Spotify. A number of you probably have, uh, have seen the document. I've been at Spotify a couple of weeks ago. And one thing that, that I, I love about Spotify is that they, they name their communities of practice guilds. Guilds, because guilds were the informal self-organizing entities a couple of uh, centuries ago that organized around certain disciplines. Like there was a guild for carpenting, there was a guild for masonry, the guild for anything. And basically the guild said, if this is the kind of work you do here, then these are the rules and practices for, guild, uh, for, 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 for you for in, that, in that discipline. And we will have masters and, 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 and journeymen, etc., etc. So they use the term guild. I like that too, so I prefer guild over community of practice because it, it has this association with craftsmanship. That's, that's fantastic. So I call them business guilds. So create your own business guild. You don't need permission from management, and management can stimulate it. They can ask for it. Why don't you create your guild across the organization, across multiple teams? It is an informal structure. Last one, improve everything. Wonderful picture I have here. This is a happiness index. This is the same company, by the way, that has these uh, little whiteboards uh, the, the, with the task board that sucks. They also have a happiness index that does not suck, by the way. This is uh, with crayon markers. The employees uh, uh, make dots and, and, and basically radiate back to everyone else how happy they feel that day. So you see all these lines going up and down. And apparently somebody here had a big problem. It was probably correlated with the person over here who was very, very happy. 
totally off the scale there. But I th I th this is amazing, because this is, this is a very, very fast feedback cycle. Right? I was once at a company that said, uh, yeah, we also measure people's happiness uh, 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 regularly. And then I asked, okay, what do you do? Well, we send these, these forms uh, every three months. Every three months. This is every day. Right? That is faster. So you need that feedback much, uh, much faster. Track, track people's happiness. And this basically forces the organization to improve because if all the lines go down collectively, well, nobody can deny that it happens and you will have to do something about it. Right? All right. So this is Marty, uh, the management model. Uh, a number of practices, a number of uh, very concrete management practices because very, very often people say uh, either managers are the impediments, we have to get rid of them, or uh, uh, managers should trust the teams, for example, or stand back from the team. And then I ask, how many meters do you want me to stand back? Five meters? Ten meters? It's not actionable. I still don't know as a manager what I should be doing and what other people can do to manage the organization. Well, these are a couple of practical suggestions. And uh, it's not about reaching a certain level. It's not about, it's not about uh, becoming level five or six or whatever. It's about increasing your health. Be healthier as an organization. So you can deal with that, with that changing environment. So, aha, you think. That's you, right? That's you. Aha. Aha. Steal healthy practices from other organizations. I gave you some examples. Use them in safe-to-fail experiments. Uh, learn as fast as possible. And uh, adapt. Adapt to your needs. Until... Melly is really smiling, right? not just faking it. All right. So if you want to know more, I advise you to join me on my mailing list because I'm publishing new practices uh, over the next uh, year that will ultimately culminate into a new book, like the Kudo Box and the Business Guilds have already been, uh, have been uh, uh, sent out. And uh, if you want to know more, you can go to SlideShare. Uh, there you will find all my presentations and everything else. So thank you very much for listening, and uh, maybe you have some questions. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> thank you very much. Amazing. Amazing. Questions? Questions? Complaints? Why didn't you sing? It's too early. You did. You did in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So, right. no questions? No questions. Okay. Good. I'm off early. Okay. I'm off the hook. Well, one question. <laughs> I can't let you off the hook. Oh, um, thanks, Lisa. <laughs> so, I was just curious about the um, this delegation board. Can you explain a little bit more how that worked? Did peop were people assigning themselves tasks or the managers were coming and, dele and actually assigning tasks? No, that was not about the individual tasks. This is about the key decision areas. Like, for example, how do we form teams? Who decides who, which person is on which team? So we don't uh, talk about a person individually, in general, as a decision area. And then we communicate, okay, well, in my case, for example, a couple of years ago, uh, I decided, but I got input from everyone else first. So basically, I, I asked people, and, and only, uh, I did only what they agreed uh, to, right? So that will be level three. I asked their input, but I make the decision. I could also say, well, you decide. But I will give you input of what I think you should be doing. Well, that will be level five. Or you, I, we can even say, I don't even need to know. Do whatever you want. Well, that's level seven. The point is, you have to make it clear. Because if you don't communicate this, then people will be totally confused. And bad things are happening, and they might be punished for making decisions that you actually didn't want them to do. Or you're expecting them to make decisions, but they're not making them because nobody knows who should be doing them. This is just visualizing the status. Good. More questions? Yeah, there we go. All right. Can you pass that? Um, I have a question about the happiness index. Yeah. It goes up and down and up and down. Um, but how do you know what's the problem when you see some uh, go up and down? Mm -hmm. You don't, uh, after five days, you don't know why did this go up or did this go down? Mm -hmm. yeah. And how do you right. make decisions based on this yeah. one? Well, it's the same with the heart rate. If you see the heart rate, bleep, 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 and then beep, it doesn't say what the problem is. It does say what the outcome is, 
the patient is almost dead. <laughs> right? So intervene. <laughs> it is a diagnostic. Uh, but it will simply re uh, signal to you, now you have to do something. Find out. So talk with people. That is basically what the happiness index does. It only detects that something is wrong. If you see it go down, and hopefully you're not, you're not getting a flatliner, uh, if, if it goes down, you have to talk about it. May, wonder what is going on. But the reasons can be legion. So uh, the, the, the sole purpose of a tool like that is to, to, to stimulate conversation. Uh, pre uh, make sure that people cannot deny what is, what is happening. There's a lot of denial in organizations, like Melly smiling over her shoulder, looking at you friendly, but she hates her fucking job at the same time. Right? That's going on a lot. Why don't you have her plot something on a happiness index? And then you'll have to have a conversation. Right? Okay. Thank you. Over there, Cecile. Hi, I have a question on beyond budgeting. Um, you said that uh, uh, it's better, you know, to have transparency and just let everybody know um, what everything costs and who spends what. Yeah. Um, and you said costs will go down, well, in certain countries in Europe. But uh, then do you also uh, know if maybe some people will feel like, oh, I can't spend any money, I really want to or should or... Uh, but I, I'm afraid of uh, other people judging me. Right. Good question. And uh, honestly, I don't know the answer. So uh, I just know that this movement is there and they have similar uh, uh, insights as we have elsewhere in the world. Like the word transparency is often used a lot in, in the agile world, openness. So uh, I see that the same, that's the same philosophy, but the details I wouldn't know. So there, there are cultural differences, not just geographically, but also between one business and another. In a banking environment, it will be very, very different from, in, from a media company, uh, for example. So you cannot simply say, from now on, everything will be transparent. That is easy for some organization. For the others, that, that would be ludicrous. Um, um, but I'm saying that uh, the, 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 um, the key thing is to get rid of the budgets. That is what you're aim, aiming for. Uh, you want to have something else in place if that ha might have an effect of uh, expenses going up. I realize that is a genuine concern that, that some, pe uh, some people have. Maybe it won't happen and they need, don't need to solve anything, but if this does happen or you do see that as a fear, you have to come up with something else that is not an annual budget, but that is a, a good enough replacement. And then in some cultures, transparency would be a good alternative. But in other cultures, in other businesses, you might need something else, for example. I don't know what they are, but we would have to ask the authors, because they have plenty more experience than I have. Good question. Thanks. More questions? Okay. Right. Thank you very much. Thank Jorn. you. It was a pleasure. It was really good. <laughs>